I have loud voice, but I don't mean my Okay, voice. I'll repeat the question. Okay, my name is Basia. I'm, I live in Tel Aviv. I'm Ola Hadasha from Poland. And I have two questions. Two One, questions? Yes. <laughs> I have more, but I limited myself to. She was negotiating already. So, <laughs> So one question is, it happened to me a few times I took pictures of Arabs living in Yafo, on the way in Yafo, I take pictures, we smile, we talk. And, I, and every time I see Arab people in Tel Aviv and I have friends living in, in Shamron, I think why there can be two millions of Arabs living in Israel and it's okay and there cannot be Jews living in the Palestinian territory. And my question is, if it was ever a subject that the settlers would stay where they live as Jews living in the Palestine territory. So this okay, is one let me repeat the question and then answer it and then okay. move to question two. Basha from Poland. Yes. With Ola Hadasha in Israel. Yes. I got that, okay. <laughs> um, Ask me, how can two million Arabs live in Israel and that's fine, and why can't Jews live in Palestine? And she asked if that was ever raised in the negotiation. You need to understand, first of all, it was raised. But the, the complexity of the question is as follows. To even have that discussion means that Israel agrees to give up on some settlements. Most Israeli prime ministers weren't brave enough to even say that. However, when you reach that stage of the discussion, and I had that discussion with three different prime ministers, you ask them, okay, what is your preference? Do we take away the settlements that we're not going to save? Or do we leave them in Palestine? Now that discussion for me is crazy. Why? Because if you leave a settlement, in my opinion, in the Arab state, most of the regular people will leave. Who will stay? The hardcore fundamentalist ideologists. The ones who will not leave for any price. So what will happen? The people who will stay on living there will be exactly the people opposed to the peace process. Having them inside the Palestinian state, even assuming the Palestinian state will treat them correctly, is in my eyes a recipe for disaster. But then what is the alternative? So in the negotiation, quite often we said, let's come up with borders, which means we don't really have to move almost any settlements, and let's find a way to make that work. Now that's very difficult to do. So what I'm trying to tell you was the issue was raised, the Palestinians said consistently, not one Jew. We didn't go into the legal side of it, no one cares. But we never reached the real discussion of this issue because even the Israelis didn't raise it yet to the level where it, became, it made sense. <laughs> Second question. The second question is about last three weeks. Oh yeah. Uh, because in my not professional eyes, uh, the accident, that, uh, the killing of policemen that started all the riots, was the provocation for everything that happened after. And yes. Do you think it was planned like this? So she's asking if the attack on the policeman in, in temp on, 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 on Temple Mount was planned in, in order to initiate this round of violence we had over the last three years, three weeks. Uh, first, I don't know. B, I don't think so. I was in charge of counterterrorism for the army, for the legal aspects, for you know, almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. Usually such things escalate, but are not planned. And what you do is you use uh, opportunities to escalate. So what happened as a result of that attack, Israel responded with security measures, which were then used as an excuse to incite the entire region. Now, if there are lessons to be learned from this recent event, I think there are two lessons. One is, no one should make short-term decisions about Temple Mount. Because it's such a powder keg that you're supposed to think long term every time you decide. I mean, I'll explain. Even the number of Israeli policemen there is something they think about very carefully so that they don't create a number which is too big which could create a problem. Every single change there which changes the status quo is potentially an explosion. So I'm not saying we were wrong in putting in the security measures, but in retrospect, that's the Israeli government is sorry that it went into this exercise because it was thinking short term and not long term. The second aspect of this is that see how easy it is to transform the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into a religious war. 
if that happens, I give up hope. Because religious wars don't end well. So we have to do everything in our power to prevent this becoming Islam versus Jews and keeping it Palestinians versus Israelis. And that event had the risk of transforming the dynamic into the danger zone, which thankfully I think has now died down. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you so much. Um, a lot of insight. This is exactly what I was looking for. Here's something I haven't heard before, and you totally did that, so thank you. Thank you very much for saying um, that. Really I paid her to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about it before. Um, so I have two questions. The first is, throughout your entire speech, and this is something that I've thought for many years, but I kind of came to the conclusion after studying a lot about the conflict, um, about negotiations, I see the greatest issue, and I think you kind of touched on this, is narrative. It's the fact that there, you talked about history, that when it came down to it, it was about the history, but what's history? It's, for them, it's, and for us, it's narrative. It's how we each see it. So one of the things that I see as being the key issue is narrative. How, we can't change their narrative. They're not going to change our narrative. And from what I feel about negotiations is we come to the table acknowledging their narrative, but sometimes we don't have that same recognition. So how do you... How do you solve an issue that it's about narrative? It's not about facts. It's about how they feel. It's about emotion. And my second question, if I may, is, um, and this I struggle with, you talked about Palestinian refugees, and I'm very familiar that Palestinians are the only group in the world that have a separate refugee status, that all of their descendants are refugees. Um, but how do, how do you, or we, or I don't know, how do people justify the fact that I'm Jewish, I was born and raised in Chicago, but I have the right to make Aliyah, and I did. And I moved to Israel, and that was something that I always struggle with answering that the question is, why do I need you have a right to return? And I'm not talking about all of the, the, no, I understand. Refugees, I understand. the refugees from that war, the seven, eight hundred that you were, eight hundred thousand you were talking about. Okay. Two great questions. Let me start with, how do we deal with the two narratives, or the 16 narratives? Because there aren't actually two narratives, there are way more than that. I think the only realistic way to resolve this dispute is for both sides to give up on the, on the dream of convincing the other side to accept that narrative. That only happens when you realize that the alternative is worse. When you think that you can get a better deal without getting a deal, you don't give up on your narrative because it's a justification for everything you do. I can share with you that in the draft of the refugee issue, for example, the Palestinians always demanded that we acknowledge our responsibility for the Palestinian refugees. And we said, what responsibility? And said, you threw them out. I said, yes, we did, but you tried to kill us first. <laughs> in the draft that I was involved in, we actually reached at least three times an agreement to write both sides recognize their share of responsibility for the creation of the Palestinian refugee issue. I was very happy to write. That's actually historically accurate. So we can overcome that, but you need to go through a process where people actually vent and then are willing to actually say, okay, so what are we going to do next? Which leads me to your next question. How can we justify not giving them the right of return when we have the right of return for ourselves? So here's my thought. First of all, I was sitting before Camp David in one of the preparatory negotiations and we were talking about the Palestinian refugee issue. And we asked them, tell us what it is actually you think is going to happen, realistically. Assume a deal. And they said, uh, we want a lot of them to come back to Israel. And I remember asking one of the leading Palestinians and said, explain this to me. You are going to be establishing the new Palestinian homeland. He said, yes. So you're going to tell your diaspora that instead of coming to your homeland, they should go and become a minority in the Jewish state? How does that make any sense? So the reality is, this is all related to the fact that they never actually decided if they're going to give up on the right of return issue. If they do, this is part of the historical compromise of the Israeli-Palestinian deal. Otherwise, there will never be a deal. And that compromise will be that there are going to be a Palestinian state and an Israeli state, and the right of return will apply to Palestine, and the right of return to Israel will apply to Israel. 
It's not perfect. It's not exactly what everyone would want. It's the best we can do. We don't have option three. So that is my answer to that question. Was that brought up, by the way? Oh, yeah. And did they agree? No. Yeah. Just going right off the bat, and I have a question, actually. Why don't you have option three? I think it probably ties into the fact that you said a bad deal is too bad for Israel to accept. But what is, what is, what is a bad deal that's unacceptable? Oh. What, what, state, what state in the region presents an existential threat other than Iran? Can you and especially thinking of the Palestinians. How do they present an existential threat to Israel in the, in the event that it's not a great deal for Israel? That's a great question. Uh, I repeat the question, if I understand it correctly, why do you fear the Palestinian deal so much? Even if it doesn't work, you're so strong, you could probably take back the territories or do something else? No, 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 just that, you could, that Israel is so strong. And, and this goes back to how you started your talk, right? You, talk, you compared it to the British colonists coming in and taking land away from the Native American what would they have had to do to create peace before total conquest? The, the British colonists would have had to say, you know what, we're the strongest one here, you guys can have this thing back, but obviously it didn't happen. It never happened. Okay, well, but was that, is that not possible that that's the only actual solution? Is the stronger power actually saying, you know what, we'll actually give you something? Well, let me start by saying that I definitely agree with you that Israel is a stronger power here. And the funny thing is that Israel doesn't feel strong in this context. Every time we enter the negotiation table with the Palestinians, most Israeli negotiators feel weak. They don't feel weak because they think that tomorrow is going to be an apocalypse. They feel weak because when they walk into the room and they, they realize that they don't feel that they are armed with ammunition which will convince the other side to change their positions. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. So what actually happens, you walk into the room and many Israelis will apply logic. Not narrative, but logic. Let's come up with the right solution. And the Palestinians will respond saying, we're not talking about the right solution as a mathematical formula. Give me back my homeland. Get out of here. And so what you actually see at the beginning of every round, and then it takes a while until you change that dynamic, is that the Israelis feel that they are only giving and not getting anything back. Now, that is actually a complicated story because it's partially true. Israel is giving back parts of territory in return for other assurances, etc. 5%. Whatever. And no settlements. Yeah. The point I'm making is that most Israeli governments facing that alternative have looked at it, politicians, and said, that is a deal I cannot sell to the Israeli public. Ergo, I will not be re-elected, or if there's going to be a national census, I will lose the census, and therefore I'm not even going to go near it. And that's before we get to those politicians who actually think we should be getting part of the West Bank. And there are some Israeli politicians who think that. Although, thankfully, none of them have ever negotiated. So what actually happens is that when we enter the room, there is a huge disparity between what the Israelis think the right deal is and what the Palestinians would respond. And the moment you have that disparity, there is no dynamic in which the Israelis say, you know what, I'll be magnanimous, take everything you want, and let's see if it works. Because what the Israelis are thinking, how dare they respond like that to me? We offered them a fair deal. And so we never reached that type of dynamic. And we've never had Israeli leadership who actually felt we're strong enough to take that risk and we don't care. Now to be fair, I'm not sure I would be that courageous. Because you know what's the scary thing for Israelis if we make a deal and we mess it up? is not only all the people who will die in the war after that. We've gone through a few of those. It's the fact that, the, that once you go through that type of crisis with the Palestinians in the West Bank, the conflict is probably never going to be resolved again in the, in the, in the near or even far future. If we actually mess it up 
and we go into a big full-fledged war again with the Palestinians in the West Bank. We know now what's going to happen. The Palestinian Authority is going to die. Hamas is going to become the motivating factor in Palestinian society, just like it happened in Gaza, for similar reasons. And we will find ourselves with an ISIS-like Palestinian entity on our east, on our south, and in our north. This is a nightmare scenario for Israel in spite of the fact that existentially, you're right, Iran is the only really strategic threat to us today. But you have to realize something which I'm sure you already know, we Israelis are really paranoid. Because we think people are out to get us. And sometimes we may be right. So because of that dynamic, the idea, the theoretical idea of why don't you just make a deal happen because you're stronger, never was an option. Other questions? Yes, please. Half of this question you just dealt with. Okay. But the punchline, I think, kind of not yet. Okay. So in certain circles, there is a, the perception. Yes that the stakeholders on the Palestinian side actually don't want to deal because their reward for staying in the no-deal status, which is kind of a, a more victim-type status, may not give their, their countrymen the greatest rev-off, but it may give them personally. Uh, wow, so yeah. what you're saying is that there's an allegation that the Palestinian leadership or some of the Palestinian leadership have a personal interest not to get a deal done. Yes, I'm not saying that that's my point, but I'm saying there is a perception out there, uh, and therefore issues like the right of return, etc., etc., are used as the final... Uh, Excuse. Yes. Okay. Yes. Personally, I think, let me take it one by one, there haven't been that many Palestinian leaders, there have been only two. Yasser Arafat, first of all, let me say something that isn't trivial, okay? People are three-dimensional. And when we look at these leaders, global leaders, we only see through the TV, we usually see only one, one or two dimensions. So when I first met Yasser Arafat, I had no idea what was going to happen. It was in early 1994. I actually met him for the first time by mistake in Egypt. I flew to Egypt for a, actually a secret negotiation and I ended the negotiation and I was waiting at the Cairo airport to fly back to Israel. And in Egypt, by the way, your importance is designated by how many bodyguards you have. And I had two, which I thought was really cool. And I was sitting at the VIP waiting room at the airport and suddenly about 20 bodyguards come in which means I, I've just been outclassed, right? <laughs> and this is before, Os before Oslo. And suddenly Arafat comes in. And I'm an IDF colonel sitting in Egypt next to the leader of the PLO, which is still a terrorist organization. So I'm thinking to myself, where's my little book, what to do when you meet the leader of the enemy organization, what you're supposed to do? And everyone in the room rises saying al Raith, al Raith, the, the president. And I'm trying to figure out if I'm supposed to conspicuously stay sitting, the only guy in the room sitting, or should I stand up? So I stand up. That was my first meeting with Arafat. I met him the following week in the, when the negotiations started. And when I came back to the office, my assistant in the army asked me, how was it to meet Arafat? And I said, prickly. I said, why? He said, because when we meet Israelis and Palestinians, we actually kiss. And I've never actually kissed someone with a beard before. <laughs> Arafat was a very complicated personality. My personal opinion was he never graduated from terrorist leader to statesman. That transition is incredibly difficult. He never made it. However, I can share with you that he was an interesting human being. I will share with you a personal anecdote. I am stupid because I proposed to my wife on her birthday and suggested that we get married on my birthday. <laughs> now, never try to get married on your birthday. You lose all the presents, right? So, the point was we actually scheduled our wedding. 
And then we flew to Y River for this round of negotiations, and I suddenly realized that the negotiations are not going to end in time. So I call my then fiance and I say to her, Diana, I have good news and bad news. And she says, what's the good news? I said, the negotiations are advancing nicely. I said, what's the bad news? They're not going to end in time. So there was the silence of the phone, if you know what I'm talking about. Right? And she said, what do, what do we need to do? I, th I said, we need to delay our wedding. So I got the silence treatment, and then said, okay. And I go back into the room, and who do you think was the only person who came up to me to apologize that I had to delay the, my wedding? Arafat. Not Clinton. Definitely not Bibi. <laughs> Arafat comes up to me and says, Daniel, I heard you had to delay your wedding because of the negotiations. I apologize. And then he points at Bibi and says, but it's his fault. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Arafat was three-dimensional, but he never made the transition. And in Camp David, he never came to make a deal. Abu Mazen is stuck in the shadow of Arafat. If he compromises beyond what Arafat would have given, Hamas will use it against him in the court of Palestinian public opinion to try to oust him. So he is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Even if he wants to make the deal, he will be judged very harshly for doing it. So my feeling is not that they have a personal self-interest not to make a deal. I think it's incredibly difficult for the Palestinian leadership to sign a deal with Egypt. They need to be very brave. And I've heard the Palestinian leaders say that they have to be brave enough to commit suicide in order to sign that deal. Okay. I'm not surprised that that's true. Tachlis, you're saying it's surmountable? I'm saying that we have no alternative, so it'll have to be surmounted. Final question. You in the back, please. Yes. No, you, you, you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since the, thank you, first of all, for your nice Yes. I'm curious about your personal opinion as to why this government continues to authorize new settlements and how you think that's going to affect prospects for our upcoming negotiations. Why would we be continuing in What are your opinions? Okay. Settlements. First of all, those of you who have attended my classes will know that I actually don't think settlements are unlawful. And I have a lengthy legal explanation which doesn't matter why I don't think they are unlawful. But it really doesn't matter. A, because everyone in the world thinks they are unlawful, so what does it matter what I think? <laughs> B, in the negotiating table, we never cared if they were lawful or unlawful, we only cared if they were there or they weren't there. So the legality is totally irrelevant for the negotiation. The reason why I am not a, 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 in spite of the fact that I don't think they are unlawful, I am not a supporter of Israeli settlement activities. Why? Because I know that the more settlements we build, the more difficult it will be to make a deal in the future. Irrespective if they are good or bad, I represent settlements. I represent settlers. I have friends in settlements. That's not the issue. The issue is that if we want a deal, we need to leave enough space between the two people to be able to come up with a border. The more Israelis build outside the existing settlement blocks, and the more Palestinians build close to those settlement blocks, the less likely it is that we will be able to ever come up with an agreement. So actually what I said once was that both sides should freeze construction in the areas under contention until we reach a deal which comes up with a line. Because if you let only one side build, that, that doesn't make sense either. Let's just say my government never accepted that, neither did the Palestinian side. But the reality is that the more both sides push the boundaries of where they are right now towards one another, the less the chances of having a deal. Guys, I think we reached the end. I've been giving signals. So I want to thank you for being with me tonight. And I'm inviting you all, the representatives of the mayor of Tel Aviv, to say a few words.